We're going to look today at uh, John chapter 8, verses 37 through 59. And so allow me to begin by reading in John chapter 8 at verse 37. And I'll read verses 37, 38, and we'll get into our study. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 37, reading to verse 38. Jesus said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And so Jesus begins, and let me lay a, a foundation for you. Jesus begins with these words, I know that you're Abraham's descendants. Uh, now, the reason he says that, let me refresh your memory, is that they had just stated in verse 33 that they, the Jews, are Abraham's descendants. They had said in verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? So they just declared themselves to be descendants of Father Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. And so as they're making that declaration, Jesus is now responding to it because they had just stated, we are Abraham's descendants. And therefore, he says in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. And so the point he's about to make, you're going to see this in a moment, is that they are physically descended from Abraham, but the reality is, though they are his physical descendants, they have a different spirit than Father Abraham. And, and he makes that clear by saying, you seek to kill me. So when he says that, I realize that you are physically descended from Abraham. The nations of Israel look to him as Father Abraham. The nation of Israel does. Uh, the reality is you have a different spirit because you desire to kill me. And that makes you different than him. Now, John has already recorded that the Jewish authorities wanted Jesus dead. We see it in, in John 5, verse 16. If you take notes, you might want to remember this because that verse tells us that they persecuted him and sought to kill him for healing on a Sabbath. In John 5, 18, that verse says that they wanted to kill him because he made himself equal with God. Later on in chapter 7, verse 19 uh, we read, did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? And then Jesus said, why do you seek to kill me? And then finally in John 7, 25, some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? And so Jesus is simply responding and speaking of that which is commonly known. Now, they, they, they are denying a desire to kill him, but Jesus once again states that they do desire to kill him. And now he gives us in verse 37 the reason that they are seeking to kill him. And notice what he says in verse 37. You seek to kill me because, so he gives you the reason, because my word has no place in you. You want to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now here's something to look at and to think about with me for just a moment. Remember, John had made the statement that these were Jews who believed in him. It says in verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. This is interesting. John had said these were Jews who believed him, and yet Jesus is saying, you seek to kill me, and my word has no place in you. These are the ones who at first had been described as those who believed him, but now these same Jews who are spoken of as believing him are arguing with them. That reveals something to us. That reveals the rejection of him because this automatically, in their argument, aligns them with his opponents. Notice what he says. You seek to kill me because you are rejecting my message. My word has no place in you. When he says my word has no place in you, my word is not advancing. My word is not gaining ground in you is what that literally means your faith is not permanent why because you do not abide in my word again remember verse 31 if you abide in my word you are my disciples indeed context is he speaking to some who john's statement was believed in him but it shows us that belief has different degrees and these are people who have a belief 
in a very superficial way who are following and listening but have not entrusted themselves to him. And so he's saying, you reject the message of salvation. And that message of salvation is founded on me and, as already declared, is built on my sacrifice for you. I'm going to die for you. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He already said that. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's, he's, he's pointing something out. It's very important for us to remember this. He's speaking to people who are rejecting the heart of the message, the heart of the message. There's a phrase that we use. Sometimes you'll, you may hear them. They'll say it's the crux of the matter. We've all heard that term. They'll say it's the crux of the matter. The word crux is the cross. It speaks of the center, what, what is the most important element of it. And for us, the crux of the matter is the cross. And he's saying you're rejecting the message of the cross. There are other things that are attracting you, but the centrality of it, my death on the cross for your salvation is what you're rejecting. You like other things, but you haven't entrusted yourself. All the way back in the first chapter, in, in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, John said it like this. He said, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But he went on to say, as, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And then he clarifies that, to those who believe in his name. So his own people and his own nation rejected him, but the ones who receive him, they're the ones who are his children. And so Jesus is saying, your life priorities have crowded your heart, and there is no room in you for my word. And my, my teachings and my invitations have had no effect or influence upon you. Why? Because you prefer your life of sin. You see, people, people today, even today, will say things like, yeah, I think it's cool, and Jesus is cool, and this and that. i looking at Kanye West right now and what's taking place with Kanye. You know, people like his music. They like the things he, he speaks about. I, I'm obviously not somebody who's familiar with that. That's not my style. That's not what I do. I don't know how to do that. What he does is, is kind of like foreign to somebody like me. But what I've been looking at is I've been looking at the fruit, and, and uh, we need to keep that, 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 that man in prayer because I'm concerned uh, not for him in particular. You know, I know he's being discipled by somebody who is a very strong believer in Scripture, and, and that's what he needs. What I get most concerned about is people who will take advantage of him to profit. And the ones who do that, normally the church, normally the, a pastor with a big budget who will give him a lot of money so he can draw a lot of people. And they're the ones who undermine the faith of the young. They're the ones that I'm concerned with the most. These pastors who will manipulate and use men like Kanye. And when he loses his luster to them, then they find the latest thing because they're building the church with their ambition and they're throwing people aside on the road. And that bothers me a lot. We need to keep Kanye in prayer because I frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to see somebody standing up and speaking so loudly, but he at the same time, he really needs to know that he's not the disseminator of the gospel. He needs to learn it. He needs to have somebody who's there who can communicate what the truth of the gospel is. He needs that. And he needs to be mentored and developed because if he's not, then he will find himself cast away later because the church has a tendency of casting away those they can't use anymore. And that concerns me greatly for him. We need to keep that man in prayer. But without that, without, you know, with, with that said, Jesus is saying, you don't have room in your heart for my word. Uh, you prefer the things of your life. You prefer your sin over salvation. As somebody said, a heart filled with the love of the world is not fit to receive the seed of the word. And that's true. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And so when you hear the word, you don't just hear it, you mix it with faith. You, you receive it by faith and act upon it. By faith, and that's what Jesus is speaking about. You see, the word of God requires a heart that's open and receptive to the things of the kingdom. In Romans 10, 17, it says it. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why in Luke 8, 18, Jesus said something. And I think sometimes if you read your Bible, you may, you may not notice what he said. He said in Luke 8, 18, 
Take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Am I receiving the word with faith? Is, the, is, is my heart, the soil of my heart, receptive so that it can, it can produce fruit and, and it can be evidence and people can see my good works and glorify my Father who's in heaven? And so be careful how you hear because sometimes people listen to Bible studies really with a, a mind to argue against what they're hearing. I'm not saying that we should put aside discernment, by the way. We need to have discernment as we listen. We have to be careful that we don't take in everything that's said simply because it's said. We have to have discernment. But at the same time, am I receiving with faith saying, God, here am I, your servant, speak. I'm listening. Or am I there just because there's nothing else to do tonight, so here I am, or on a Sunday, so here I am. But I really have no intent to hear. Uh, I, I hear, but I don't do. Well, Jesus is speaking to these people who are, are hearing but not doing. They're not receiving it. And so as he's speaking to them, again, he says that. He says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants. You seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. You're not receiving it by faith so that your life can be changed. In verse 38, I speak what I have seen with my father. I'm an eyewitness. I've been with my father. I'm speaking that which I've seen with him. But you, you do what you've seen with your father. I'm an eyewitness. I can accurately communicate my Father's will to you. In John 6, we saw at verse 46 that uh, we read, uh, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father, and that's what Jesus is saying. I'm an eyewitness, so I'm able to communicate my Father's mind, and, and I can communicate my Father's will because I'm at one with it, and I know it completely. But, verse 38, on the other hand, you do what you've seen with your father. So this contrasts what he's saying with what they're doing. You see, their actions are consistent with their father's character. They're trying to kill him. And so as this is taking place, verse 39, they answered and they said to him, Abraham's our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So again, they claim descent from Abraham. But he's saying, no, if you were his sons, you would do his work. Now, when you look at Abraham, you can see things about him. You can see that he was merciful. You can see that Abraham was loving. He was charitable. He was hospitable. You can see just by reading his story, he was obedient, and he was a man who was justified by faith. And so the point he's making is if you were really like Abraham and he really were your father, then, then you would receive me. You would act on that. You see, in Galatians 3, 6, and 7, the Bible says that Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. And therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Only those who are of faith are children of or sons of Abraham. And so he's making it very clear. You really are not children even though of Abraham, even though you're saying he's your father. Because if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You seek to kill me. If you were his children, you would accept me because I've told you truth. But instead, you're looking for a way to kill me. And Abraham never did anything like that. And that's why he says in verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. Now, at this point, he has not disclosed to them who their father is yet. But there is a family resemblance. And that's what he's speaking about. I saw a picture of my mother's dad, my grandfather. And I was just, just yeah, my son, you know, showed it to me. It's on his phone. I never really noticed it as I've grown older. I looked like my mother's father. And I thought, wow, you know, there's a family resemblance. My son David's got a little girl and a little boy, and his wife Des is pregnant with uh, their third baby. And he, he sent me a picture of that, that sonogram, you know, and boy, that's amazing now, I'll be honest with you, how, how clear it is. And he wrote and he said, Des is mad because the baby looks just like David, you know, ugly. And, and <laughs> the family resemblance, there's a family resemblance. 
And so if you were like, if you were Abraham's kid, you'd be like him. That's what Jesus is saying. And you're nothing like him. You have a different father, and he'll make that clear in a moment. But as he says that to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. You'd, now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. Then, verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Let's look at that for just a moment. We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now, the commentators like to point out the nuances of this, the variety of ways that you can view this. Um, when it says we are not born of fornication, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets were inspired to use that image to, to be a type of or a, uh, a picture of, of uh, idolatry, of idolatry. Um, in Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 3, 8 and 9, it, it reads, I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away, given her a writ of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. She went and was a harlot also. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. It's a picture of committing adultery with stones and trees. is a picture of idol worship. And so... God is saying there are children that are polluting the land that are actually born of fornication. That's the image. You see the same kind of picture in the book of Hosea in chapter 1, verse 2, which says, when the Lord first spoke to Israel through Hosea, he said to Hosea, go and get married. Your wife will be unfaithful and your children will be just like her. In the same way, my people have left me and become unfaithful. And so when they say here, we have not been born of fornication, commentators, uh, older commentators say this is a way of saying we are not idolatrous. We are children of Abraham, remain faithful to, to the covenant that Abraham had uh, with, with God. So they're saying we haven't been born of spiritual fornication. So we are genuine Jews. We are followers of God. We aren't apostates. Our father is God. When you look in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, it reads, Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? And so they're saying, we're not born of fornication. God is our father. Abraham is the one who brought the faith to us, and we've remained faithful. So that's one way the commentators say that, that this couldn't be applied. But there's another. They may be saying that, they have kept records. Their lineage is, is, is pure, that they are, they are nationally and they are ethnically Jewish. You see that in, uh, in, in Paul's, uh, in Philippians 3, when Paul is giving his genealogy and he speaks of his descent. And the Jews did keep their genealogies. And so there are other commentators who say they may simply be saying that they are factually, uh, ethnically Jewish, but then there's another way to look at it, and we need to remember this. Remember that Jesus' conception had been called into question. Remember that? And remember how that his mom had gone to spend time with Elizabeth and uh, her, her, her relative and had returned. She's an unmarried woman and yet came back to Nazareth pregnant. And I've shared this with you recently. Nazareth was a small village. When you think of the city of Nazareth, don't think in terms of uh, cities here in California because you'll, you'll be wrong. Nazareth was a small village. There are some commentators who say that the population of that village could, be a, could have been as little as 40 to 60 people. There are others who say that the, the village of Nazareth during the time of Christ could have been no more than 200. And so that's a small village. You know, if you have a church of, of 40 people, do you think everybody knows your business? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Even a church of 200, they'll pretty much know your business. And if you're living in a village day in and day out, they're going to know everything about you. 
And in a small village, when Mary comes back, and she hasn't been, you know, formally married to Joseph, we are not born of fornication. We have one father. And there are those, myself included, who think that this is at least an inference in that, that they're slamming Christ. We have purity, morality. <laughs> who are you to tell us anything? And so I can't help but see a hint, at least a hint of that. This could be an intimation that they believed him to have been born of fornication. And they say, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. If God were your father, you would love me. Keep that in mind. Because there are those who say, oh, I love God, but they don't love Jesus. You can't love the father and not love the son. You can't. Jesus is making it clear. If you love the father, you would love me. So when you encounter people who will say, oh, I love God, but I have nothing to do with Jesus, Jesus would say, no, if God were your father, you'd love me. And that's a very clear statement. You see, to love God is to love the Son. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, John said, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. When you have the Son, you have the Father. When you have the Son who is the Savior of the world, then you have relationship with the Father. So when someone is a believer, love for Jesus is implanted within them. You see, where there's no love for Jesus, there's no regeneration in the life of that person. In 1 John 5, 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves a father loves his child as well. And so Jesus is saying that. So whenever you encounter somebody who says, oh, I, I'm a lover of God, and <laughs> You know, and I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. I really don't. And I, when I speak to people and have spoken to people who make comments like that, I certainly don't disrespect them. I don't. I believe that every person, uh, under normal circumstances at least, deserves the respectful hearing and without an arrogance on my part to try and, you know, make them look dumb or whatever or have arguments. I, that's not what Scripture teaches us to do, and I, I don't do that. I respect them. So if they say, well, I love God, then... Well, then the conversation I'd have to bring up, well, Jesus said to love the Father is to love the Son. Do you love the Son? What do you mean love the Son? Well, Jesus said if you have the Father, you have the Son also. And do you love the Son? What do you mean? And now I can share the gospel. Well, this is why you would love the Son. Look what the Father did. He sent his Son to die on a cross for you. Look what the Son did for you. How can you not love him? How can you not how can you not be grateful to him for all that he's done? Amen. That's, that's true. And he goes on. He goes on and he says, I proceeded forth and came from God. So when he says, I proceeded forth and came from God there in verse 42, it, it speaks of Jesus being what has been referred to theologically as the eternal son, the eternal son of God. He is the only begotten and it causes us to think of the scriptures that we recite and, and sing uh, on the, in the Christmas season. Micah 5, 2. You, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from old, of old, from everlasting. I proceeded forth and came from God. I am the eternal son. Isaiah 9, verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So I proceeded forth and came from God. He says, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. My, my ministry is not self-initiated. I did not take the office of Messiah upon myself. I, I have come because my father sent me. He sent me to perform the work of salvation. And 
He says in verse 43, well, why do you not understand my speech? Here it is, because you are not able to listen to my word. You cannot follow my train of thought. You cannot understand my language because you cannot follow my train of thought. You cannot follow my train of thought, and here's the key, because you cannot tolerate what I'm saying. That gives you insight. For those of you who share your faith, that gives you insight. When you're trying to talk to somebody about what God has done in your life, and they begin to want to argue and fight and find nitpicks sometimes, you know, ask you questions that they think are going to stump you just because. If God is so great, can he, can he create a God greater than himself? If God is so great, can he, can he create a, a rock that's too heavy for him to pick up? Just, just because you put the word God in a question doesn't make the question smart. God does not do anything that doesn't correspond to his essential uh, unity of purpose. He doesn't do nonsensical things. He, he's a God of logic. <laughs> he's a God of order. And so just because somebody uses the word God doesn't make the question a good question. But sometimes people want to debate and argue with you. And again, they're, they're arguing uh, and all of that because they don't understand. And, and, and the scripture is very clear about that, that... Um, that the, uh, the non-saved person doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, because they're foolish, foolishness to them, and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It takes the Holy Spirit. Jesus had said that. Now, when we get into chapters 14 through 16, you'll see this clearly, and I'll be pointing this out to you. But he speaks concerning the role of the Holy Spirit and how he's going to take what he has said and he's going to make it plain to us. And so when people don't have a relationship with God, it's nonsensical. It makes no sense to them at all because God's ways are above their ways. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, he says that. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways and, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In Romans 11, 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no way that my puny brain can ever understand the ways of God. That's why he reveals himself to us, because we could never figure him out. Because if you could figure God out, then you're God yourself, and you can't. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. The higher as the heavens, the, the heavens, as high as the heavens are, his thoughts are above ours. And then and that's, who's, who, Paul also asked the Romans, he said, who's been God's counselor? Who, who, hey, when God's in a problem, does he ever call you up or text you? Or is he one of your Facebook friends? I know that God friended me as a show, but has he ever friended you? I mean, does he call you up and say, look, at you know, I'm having a tough time with China. So can you help me? You know, I mean, that's the arrogance of man. We actually, we actually think we can advise God. And that's what Jesus, by the way, is approaching with these people here. He says, see, my word has no, no place in you. You're not hungry for truth. You're, you're, you're curious to the degree of how, how Athenians perhaps were in Acts 17, where they were always looking for some new thing and arguing amongst themselves about it. You want to know certain things, but not to the point of actually entrusting yourself to them. You want to know God? A lot of people say yes, but what happens when the gospel is presented? That shows you something. Because when you give the first word of the gospel, the first word of the gospel is repent. And so when you say, well, you need to repent, oh, no, no, no. no I'm not that bad. How many of us have said that? I've said that. I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. Now, you want to know bad. I've got some friends. Let me introduce you to some of my friends, and you'll see I'm a saint compared to them. Because a lot, you know, I used to say it like this. A lot of us keep somebody handy as a friend that we can point to when everybody's convicting us. Like, oh, you think I'm bad? <laughs> you don't know this guy over here. He's, he's, no, that's bad. I mean, if you look up the word evil in the dictionary, just his picture. <laughs> that's evil. You know, but there are those who speak about wanting to know God. But when they hear him speak, 
they reveal that they really don't want to know him. Why? Because the first thing he says is, your life is messed up. You're, 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 you're really messed up. You're in sin. I'm not that bad. I, I didn't say that you were that bad. I said you're in sin. And your sin makes a separation between you and your God. And he will not hear you. There is a distance between you, a chasm that your sin is created. And you have God on one side and you're on the other. And this chasm of sin has got to be, there's got to be a bridge of some sort or else you're going to be on this side, he's on that side, and there's no way you can have relation. And that's where Jesus comes in, and that's why we call him the bridge. He's the one who's bridging man and God, and, and, and he's the one who does that, and he has ways that he can do that. And it's amazing because one of the things that we need to always remember is that the Lord has a desire to save people. And, and if you are sharing with someone you can pray and say, God, in Jesus' name, would you please reach this person? And, and God so often answers those prayers because his desire is to save them more than you want them to be saved. When our church was new, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't give uh, uh, invitations. And um, I knew everybody. It was, you know, I knew everybody in the church pretty much. And we started getting visitors and and a lady approached me after a sunday morning and said to me you know i i come from a church where the pastor gives invitations have you ever considered giving an invitation and i, and I smiled at her i said you know i know all of these people you know she says well you ought to consider it and i did so the next week i thought why not maybe god's telling me to and i still remember the very first invitation that i gave in this church it was in a place called uh, Church of God Seventh Day on Vine Street, a small building that sat 120 people, and we had about 60 people or so, 70 people in church. And I, I gave an invitation, and a person came forward, a, a young lady named Tracy. And I, I stepped down, and I talked to her after she had prayed with me, and she says to me, you know, she goes, my boyfriend, I have a boyfriend, his name is Frankie, and he's in Oregon. She said, he's not a believer. Uh, I, I gave my heart to Christ. I want to be a follower of Jesus. What should I do? I said, well, Tracy, the Bible's pretty clear. You're not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I said, share the gospel with Frankie. And if Frankie gives his heart to Christ, you know, then you can date. But if he refuses Jesus, you're going to have to make a diff difficult decision because the scripture teaches us not to be unequally yoked. You shouldn't be dating an unbeliever. Now, that's kind of a, that, that's what the Bible teaches and my responsibility, but I laid it on her. She comes to church the next week. She says, Pastor David, she goes, I, I, want, I want to tell you something. She said, I went home from church and, and I prayed and I said, God, help me. And I got to talk to Frankie. She says, I call Frankie up. And I said, Frankie, hi, how are you? And he says, Trace, got to tell you something. He said, I went to church today and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, I went to church today and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I performed their wedding, dedicated their children. So, so God, God, God answers prayer. You know, if you have a heart that's uh, open to receive. But when you want to argue with him, point by point, and that's what Jesus is dealing with right here. You don't understand my speech. My word isn't, you're not able to listen to my, my, my word. Why? Verse 44, because you're, you're, now he tells them, you are of your father, the devil. No, you're Jesus, that's mean. But he says it, <laughs> you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And he goes on, and is even more kind. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. That's pretty strong. Yeah, you have a father. You want to say Abraham is your father. You just said it. Abraham is our father. No, you have a father. It's not Abraham, and it's not God. It's the devil. Now, it's interesting how the climate changed because when you see earlier, as mentioned, John had said these people who, these were people who believed him. But look at how they're treating him. 
Even sympathetic listeners show their true colors when provoked. See, the actual fact is they're children of the devil and naturally disposed to sin. In Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, it says it like this. As for you, you were dead in your tra transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So he was a murderer from the beginning. Jesus said, doesn't stand in the truth. In other words, Satan from the beginning was a deceiver, a liar. He deceived our first parents, Adam and Eve. And through that deception, death entered into the world. Romans 5, 12. By one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So he was, he was a liar. He was an instigator of murder. Remember that he instigated the first murder in 1 John 3, 11 and 12. This is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So Satan is the one who inspires murder, and he's the one who inspires and provokes lying. In verse 45, but because I tell the truth, <laughs> you do not believe me. Their opposition to him is because he tells him the truth, and they resist it. By the way, that is a sign of the last days. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or healthy teaching, but according to their own desire, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth. They will be turned aside to fables. They don't have a heart to receive what is true. So he goes on and makes an even deeper statement, verse 46 and 47. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear this is something you underline. You do not hear because you are not of God. That's powerful. Which of you convicts me of sin? Jesus is claiming to be sinless. 1 John 3, 5 says, You know that he was manifested to take away our sins. In him there is no sin. 1 Peter 2, 22 speaks, says that Jesus committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Which of you convicts me of sin? Jesus was sinless. Now, he claims to be without sin, but notice they don't respond. He exposes the falseness of their charges of blasphemy and Sabbath breaking as he's doing this. But notice verse 47, he who is of God hears God's words. You don't hear because you're not of God. He gives the reason for the constant opposition to him. You do not hear God's word because you are not of God. Again, was mentioning this a moment ago. Why are not your friends interested in the Bible? Why do they not listen to you? You have that. You have that, don't you? You have friends that don't listen when you talk to them. Why? Why not? Sometimes they'll tell you, I already have a church I'm going to, right? You invite them to church. I had to come to church. Come visit my church. No, I already got a church. When's the last time you went? Well, you know, I already got a church. They never go. You know, when's the last time you went? Well, I'll be going next month. It's Christmas. Everybody goes, and then a few months later, I'll go again. You know, I'm not a fanatic. You know, that kind of thing. Why don't they listen to you? This is an answer for you. I'll be honest with you. I have to say it quickly because my time's running short. Um, this, when I was first saved, this, this is one of the verses that stood out to me, John 8, 47. It's one of the verses. You don't listen because you don't believe. That's why. You're not of God. God's word, and I, I, I have to be careful because I, I could go for a while on this, and I, I don't want to. I'll tell you this. When I've gone through a sorrow of heart, I have had people 
come up and, and give me human comfort and be honest with you, I appreciate that. I do. I appreciate I appreciate that. A brother or a sister who says, you know, I, I love you and, um, you know, I, I appreciate that. I do. But what has ministered to me most deeply is when someone has got their arm on my shoulder and they say, you know, the Lord put this on my heart for you and they give me a scripture because my heart is hungry for God's comfort, not just human comfort. And, 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 and I think that sometimes we may, we, we may not be wise in how we approach that. Sometimes we'll just say, all things work for the good of those who love God, that kind of thing, and not take it into consideration the pain they're going through. So I'm not one who dumps scripture on you like that. I'm not, though I probably could find a scripture for your situation. And I do want to love you. But there's a certain point where, you know, let's just remember who's in charge. Let's remember that my God is the defender, and he's with us now. He has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So know that today, and that will bring you comfort. And, and when you're sharing your faith with people and you bring the word out and they don't want to hear it, that's because they're not saved, and that word is foreign to them. In this particular context, Jesus is saying, you don't want to hear what I'm saying because though you're claiming to be Abraham's children and, and that God is your father, the fact is, if you loved him, you'd love me. If you loved me, you'd love my word. My word isn't something I invented. It's the word my father gave, the word of salvation called the gospel. You would receive that. You'd know who I am. Your life would be transformed. But because you want to argue, it's telling me you're not born of fornication. Abraham is your father. It's only revealing to me that you're rejecting the message of the gospel, and that's the point that he's making. Now, as he says that to them, that really gets under their skin. The Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I don't have a demon. I honor my father and you dishonor me. And, and I don't seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And so, this comment, do we not rightly say that you're a Samaritan, that's not found anywhere else in Scripture. That was a common statement that is being mentioned but isn't recorded anywhere else. It's a well-known thing. So what are they doing? Well, they're calling into question his loyalty to the Word of God and his pure, the purity of, of the Jewish faith. Um, Samaritans, when they said, don't we say you're a Samaritans? Remember, Samaritans combined Jewish ritual with their pagan gods. In, in 2 Kings 17.33, it says they feared the Lord, yet served their own gods, according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. So they were looked at as being disloyal to God. And they also are saying that he's in league with and empowered by Satan. They're not a they're not arguing with this message. They're attacking him as a person. And, and that's why in verse 49, Jesus says, I don't have a demon. I honor my father. You dishonor me. So he ignores the charge that he's a Samaritan. He denies that he's demon-possessed. He's simply saying, I honor my father, and uh, he is with me, and he has not left me. In verse 49, he says, you've dishonored me. So this reveals how Jesus responded to their treatment of him and his claims. They wounded him in their unbelief and by their attacks and accusations. In Psalm 69, verses 7 through 9, it reads, Because for your sake I have borne reproach, shame has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. You dishonor me, but in your dishonoring of me, you dishonor my father. Remember John 5, 23, all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. I'm going to close here because I don't want to rush through the last verses um, because there's a whole lot that I wanted to share, and I'm looking at my notes right now, and I'm not going to be able to fully do justice to this because when we get to verses 58 and 59, I, I want to spend time with you there, and I'll pick that up next week. But let me close with a couple of thoughts. Verse 
He says in verse 50, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Jesus didn't come to seek his own glory, but to bring glory. He brought glory to his father. And the glory that he brought to his father was related to his sacrifice. When he yielded himself up, he satisfied his father's commands. He paid the ultimate price. He appeased his father's wrath, and he provided salvation for us. So we, when I say, you do not honor me, Jesus is saying, ultimately, I'm not seeking glory from you. My father is the judge. And my father is the one who will glorify me. In John 17, he says, the time has come, Father, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Never look, I'll close with this as an application, and again, I'll pick up next week. Um, you want to be used by the Lord? Don't do anything to get man's attention. That's easy. We can close with that, right? Don't do anything to take attention from God. The ones who have impacted me the most are the ones that you would probably say are the most invisible. Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, impacted me more than any other pastor. I had a guy, some of you, you know, there's a lot of young people in here right now. I, you, you may have not have heard of this guy. His name was, um, was Duffy. He used to have a program on KKLA years ago, Warren Duffy. How many of you even remember that name? See, a few of you do. Warren Duffy. Warren Duffy called me up one time. He was talking to me at my house, and he called me up. And... Um, actually a couple times, asking for it. I can say this, it sounds, as I'm saying, but it's true, it's true. So I'll just say what is true and let you think I'm bragging or boasting or being weird. <laughs> it, it's, it's true. He, he said, David, I wanted to talk to you, uh, uh, and he wanted advice. And that's kind of funny because he was a lot older than me, and yet he was calling me up at my house saying, I want some advice from you because he, he knew of my ministry and he knew that uh, that I that I have a, a love for my wife, and he he was asking advice in that. And so Warren called me up at my house and was talking to me. And as he was speaking to me, just you know, he was going to later on he was going to interview me on the radio. He um, he says uh, he says David he says uh, who's your pastor? He says I have two. And he 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 gave me the name of his pastors, you know, Jack Hayford and Chuck Smith. And he says, Who's, who are your pastors? And I said, Warren, I only have one. I've only got one. I don't have many pastors. I have one pastor. His name is Chuck Smith. See, I'm, I, I was not and still am not one of those sheep that said, oh, I have a pastor on Sunday night when I go to this church, and then I have a pastor on Wednesday when I go to this church, and then I have another pastor on Sunday morning when I go to that church. I was never that guy. I had one pastor. I had one pastor, Chuck Smith. You know, I'm, one, I'm a one-person guy, let's face it. I got one wife. I don't need 15 others, you know. I've got one wife. My heart is sold out to one person. That's me. My loyalties are that way. And so that's how it was with me as a Christian. That's how I am as a Christian. I have one pastor, Chuck Smith. He's in heaven, but he's still ministers to me through his tapes and his ministry, his books. He's still my pastor. He'll always be. And when I go to heaven, he's Pastor Chuck to me, even though he's, he used to tell me, no, I'm just Chuck. We're brothers. No, no, no. You're Pastor Chuck. You know, you're my pastor. And I, I really think it's important for us to know who pours into our life and, 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 and to, to, to give honor in that way, but to always keep in mind that when it's all said and done at the very end, that, that Jesus Christ is the one who brings honor to his Father. And I, as a minister, am supposed to be out of the way so that you can glorify God. That's how it works. And sometimes I stumble into the way I realize that. I tell a story here or bring something, uh, something up there, and I regret it later. I say, oh, I took away from you Jesus today. I tried to illustrate it, but... Uh, but here's your bottom line. We'll stop here. We'll pick up next week, and I'll develop this with you. Um, Jesus came to bring honor to his Father, and we are supposed to bring honor to ours. And may we live in such a way that our Father is honored. And yes, there'll be those who won't want to hear, but may we do the best that we can in Christ to glorify him.
because Jesus came so that he might glorify his Father. And you and I benefited from what he did because we now, through him, can do the same. And may our lives bring glory to him. Again, we'll pick up next week as we go through this passage.